Now, why do we discuss colonial history, especially the Korean comfort women issue? Uh, because one, it's considered a main obstacle to Korea-Japan cooperation, the two leading East Asian democracies, and therefore it's a main obstacle to any future European Union-style Asian Union of democracies. Uh, in 2015, the Korean and Japanese governments agreed to uh, official compensation and apology. Uh, so the so Prime Minister Abe expresses anew his most sincere apologies and remorse to all the women who underwent immeasurable and painful experiences and suffered incurable physical and psychological wounds as comfort women. Uh, plus 100 million won for each survivor woman or her family. But the next, and this was signed by Prime Minister Abe and South Korean President Park Geun-hye. But the next Korean president, President Moon, uh, he de facto, you know, rejected the agreement. He argued that the reality is that a majority of our people cannot accept the agreement emotionally. The countries must look squarely to their history. So issues related to their past will not become an obstacle. The personal reason is that in 2012, uh, one of my students uh, from Japan, she did not come to class for for you know for for at least two weeks. So I and other students were worried and concerned. And then later she returned and described her experience. Uh, so and so she and so she wrote that although many victim advocates claim to condemn the bad government of Japan, that is people, many Koreans do not make such distinctions. In 2012, one of my exchange students experienced this anti-Japanese sentiment while taking the Seoul subway. Quote, a stranger spoke very ill of Japan when he found me talking with my Japanese friend. He said, hey, damn, the child of decisor, sly invader, go out from Korea as soon as possible. I shall never forget this word. The word decisor was too cruel. It was like a stab in the chest. Intellectuals should stop using this kind of harsh words because they have a big effect on the people. And so Yunko experienced a dominant perspective in Korea, which is that the Japanese were invaders, were evil, sly invaders. And their most evil act was the comfort woman system that the Japanese military kidnapped, enslaved, and mostly killed 200,000 Korean girls the current Japanese government hides or denies these facts and views the contrary reflect that of Japanese right-wingers and their Korean collaborators, what we call, in other words, their denialists. Um, and so the, the popular 2016 movie, Spirit's Homecoming, ki uh, talks about, this portrays Korean girls as kidnapped, abused, and their bodies burned. To destroy by Japanese soldiers. Uh, the movie implies, the movie states that only 238 of 200,000 women came back, that only 0.1% survived. The director, Cho Jung, Cho Jung Rae, he got the inspiration from a painting by Kang Yun Cher. And the painting shows her experience that, Jap that Japan soldiers pulled the comfort women who are suffering from disease or weakness to the incinerator and shoot them. The soldiers then set the dead bodies on fire to destroy any proof of what they have done to the girls. Kang in drew the picture during a psychological treatment session. Okay. Um, and both the United Nations, the 1996 UN Komara Swine Report, uh, the South Korean courts, which declared the comfort women system to be anti-humanity acts, systematically planned and perpetrated by the Japanese empire. And also the Korea observer, that 80% of the estimated 70 to 200,000 comfort women were Korean. And so uh, this reflects the dominant perspective. And the dominant perspective mostly comes from the testimonies. We have about 238 publicly registered comfort women, but about 14 to 16, uh, they share the dominant testimony and they're mostly associated with the House of Sharon. 
But recent, but in the past two decades has seen a revisionist perspective that stresses context, complexity, and contingency. And this is represented by scholars such as Hapta Ikuhiko, Sarah So, and Park Yuha. And so, um, so scholars like Hapta argue that probably 20 to 80,000 comfort women, that the ethnic Japanese outnumber Koreans, and most join because of poverty. No evidence that the military abducted any Korean or Taiwanese women intentionally. So Hate argues that 40% were from Japan, the most heavily represented nation. Uh, many were sold to brokers by the parents, some responded willingly, others were deceived. Uh, so context and complicity. So before, during, and after the colonial Korea, socially weak groups were recruited for sex work with su state supervision or complicity. Sometimes it was forced recruitment in the pre-colonial era, uh, the Koryo and Joseon dynasties rounded up women to send to China as tribute women. Um, and then during the Joseon dynasty, uh, you had Nam Sadang art troops, male entertainers, which recruited young boys, sometimes for sexual labor with their clients, with their customers. During colonial Korea, um, almost all of this, almost all of the documented survivors came from very poor families. And then post-colonial Korea, that maybe from 1945 to you know to you know to now, uh, scholars such as Catherine Ree suggest maybe two to three hundred thousand comfort women for the U.S. military. These were private comfort stations or brothels, but supervised by the U.S. and South Korean governments. And uh, Sarah So finds that the general operational methods of the Korean army comfort women system were reminiscent of the Japanese system. And then here's you know, one of the pictures from those days. Um, and there's allegations of comfort stations in Vietnam as well. The second factor is contingency that you know, an outcome is not inevitable, but shaped by chance and agency that basically winners write history and shape our dominant public understanding. Um, so for example, today, uh, you know, so my family, so I was born in Gwangju, uh, which is in the Nchaloda region, uh, but I do not consider myself to be a Pekche person. I consider myself when I was growing up to be a Korean person. Because why? Because Baekje no longer exists. Baekje fought a war against Shilla and Baekje lost. Specifically, Baekje and his ally Yamato Japan lost against Shilla and his ally Tang China. And with the aid of China, Shilla conquered Baekje, unified Korea. And so people from Baekje no longer identify themselves as Baekje, but as Koreans. Um, and a similar process almost happened um, in Korea because in the 1890s and 1900s, the Korean political elites were split between China, Russia, and Japan. And initially pro-Japan elites won with Japanese. Um, and so in August 1910, Japan effectively annexed Korea with the Japan-Korea Treaty. The dominant perspective is that the Korean Prime Minister, Lee Wan Young, he signed the 1905 treaty and other treaties with Japan because he was greedy, he was a traitor, he wanted fame and fortune. But a more complex perspective would argue that, you know, from Lee Wan Young's perspective, the old regime, Joseon Dynasty, was no longer viable, and that a new partnership with Japan would modernize the Korean economy, help its people. The Korean monarchy would be equally incorporated into the Japanese monarchy, similar to Austria-Hungary. And from their perspective, this works because the Japanese monarchy already shares Korean royal ancestry from the Baekje era. And so in the 1930s, you had a yet many Koreans who consider themselves to be part of the Japanese empire. 
they serve as and those who served as comfort women or soldiers were considered patriots. And when Japan was many, winning, more Koreans wanted to join the winning side. But in 1945, Japan lost, US won. And so since 1945, uh, the post-1945 regime has developed an anti-Japan, pro-US identity. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Thank you. Uh, so when I asked my students in Korea, like, you know, which government killed the most number of Koreans? Okay. Uh, and so many Koreans instinctively reply Japan. But technically, that's not right. The government that killed the most number of Koreans was actually my adopted country, the United States. So the U.S. military killed more ethnic Koreans and used more comfort women than did the Japanese military. But they enjoy a much more positive image in South Korea. So it's considered an honor for Koreans to serve in the U.S. Army, either as Katusa or as, you know, as Korean American members or as Korean American members, you know, who go to West Point. And and every elected South Korean president first calls a South Korean president and honors the US troops who fought in Korea. Okay. You can imagine if Japan won, the you know, the South Korean leader, you know, the Korean leaders will honor those who fought for Japan, not for the not those who fought for the US. The final point is that, you know, that scholars understand that activists oftentimes pressure and manipulate victims testimonies sometimes intentionally sometimes unintentionally and so we always need to ask were the you know when we rely on testimonies is this based on empirical evidence or are they basically saying what the audience wants to hear and we we know this from other victims testimonies as well uh, so for example one of, so one testimony comes from a North Korean defector student. Um, and he talks about how, like when he was young, I saw four people being executed by the government. Okay. I know the crime of one woman because I heard from adults that it was human trafficking, but I don't know about the other three. Okay. But depending on the audience, he gives different answers why the other three were shot. When he speaks to a university audience, I only talk about what I know, okay? And so I say like, you know, one crime was human trafficking. I don't know about the other three. But when I, when I talk with conservatives, uh, I tell them that, oh, you know, the other three were executed because they were doing like human rights dissident activity because that's what conservatives want to hear. But when I listen to, but when I talk to people who view North Korea positively, then I say that, oh, those three were executed because of crimes like rape and murder. So for a leftist audience, that's what they want to hear. And so depending on the audience, I change my testimony. Okay, unstop. Okay, uncold. And so this leaves us with, you know, so for scholars, this leaves us some key questions. One is, what are the best estimates for the number of comfort women and Korean comfort women? Were any women from Korea and Japan directly abducted by Japanese military or deceived by Korean officials and private brokers pretending to be soldiers? Three, did Korean women receive larger advance payments during wartime and could they leave after their contract expired? Did some activists pressure and manipulate women's testimonies? To what extent was the military hierarchy aware of and complicit in the deceptive practices of private brokers and corrupt officials? How does the Japanese comfort women system compare to the comfort stations for US soldiers in South Korea and South Korean soldiers in the Vietnam War? Are your students aware of such comparisons? And then seven, uh, what, are the what are the legal and non-legal restrictions against comfort women-related academics and artists in South Korea, Japan, 
and U.S. In other words, uh, for, for instance, how widespread is left-wing harassment of scholars in Korea and right-wing harassment of scholars and artists in Japan? Okay. Now, I close with two liberal approaches to, you know, to address these questions. And by liberalism, I refer to liberal norms and rights, which we can split between procedural norms and rights, you know, fair means, fair procedures, such as free speech, objectivity, pluralism, legal equality under the law, and substantive ends, fair, you know, you know such as social justice, equal dignity for victimized groups. Now, some people uh, think in terms of positive sum between procedural and substantive rights and norms, that procedural rights and norms do not detract and ultimately do not detract from and ultimately support substantive rights and norms. So people like Andrew Lankoff, University of Chicago Bruce Cummings, right? That, you know, Koreans should read what was written by the left and right, so expose them to diversity. Bruce Cummings writes, the way to bridge social and ideological conflict is to let the truth come out, let people debate the truth in a democratic manner, and thus use history to pursue reconciliation with those who think differently than you do. And so by open, thorough debate, we can find out what actually happened in the past and come to some kind of reconciliation, some kind of consensus on the past. And so we can decide whether the 2000, you know, 2015 agreement, the compensation and apology, was that appropriate or do we need more? So we need to understand what happened in the past. Okay. But the zero sum perspective argues that no, the procedural rights and norms sometimes detract from substantive rights and norms. That the vic and so they part so they pro so they so people who think this way prioritize the rights of victimized groups over the procedural rights and norms of oppressors. And so from the victims, but then for the victims' rights perspectives, we can also subdivide between left wing and right wing. So the you know people who are strongly progressive sees Koreans as victims and the Japanese as oppressors. And people who are more conservative consider you know, Christians, religious dissenters to be victims, and such as the Falun Gong or Christians, and oppressors to be communists, whether the North Korea or Chinese regime. Okay. Um, and so, you know, victims' rights proponents disseminate uncorroborated claims about the sufferings of victimized groups, such as that the North Korean regime tortures Christian prisoners were Morton Aaron or that the Chinese communist regime mass harvests the organs of Falun Gong practitioners. Okay, so victims' rights, uh, oftentimes these stories come from victims' testimonies and victim rights scholars do not challenge these testimonies. But people who, but media and scholars who are more, you know, more in the model of procedural liberalism uh, you know, they want objectivity, uh, they want scientific evidence, you know, they, and so Western media actively interrogate the claims of victims advocates favored by the political right, such as Falun Gong protectioners or Korean defectors. So for victim, so for victims favored by the political right, uh, the Western media and scholars, they tend to be more scientific and objective and critical. Are these testimonies you know, do, where, you know, do they actually have substantive evidence? Well, so far, not so much for victims supported by the political left, such as Korean comfort women. So from the procedural, but from the procedural rights and norms perspective, credibly distinguishing between corroborated and non-corroborated claims is essential for genuine understanding and effective advocacy for victimized groups. Okay. But in South Korea, uh, we have this strong contest, legal and political contest between victim rights versus procedural rights. 
about you know and and so until re at least until recently victims rights victims rights proponents had the upper hand and so professors who would challenge the dominant perspective they were legally prosecuted and at least one a suncha national national university professor was in prison for you know for for making comments such as that Koreans probably volunteered to be comfort women. The university terminated Song's employment and a court sentenced to six months in prison for saying lies about comfort women. Okay. Um and then I had personal experience that so not just scholars who made comments about comfort women, but scholars who defend the rights of this you know, to, to make dissenting comments, you know, like, so if you argue for freedom of speech, you can also be condemned and canceled. And so I wrote an essay in The Diplomat calling for debating, not censuring, Harvard professor Mark Ramsier. Um, and so the South Korean media characterized both dissenting academics um, and those who defended their academic freedom as different shades of denialism regarding the Japanese military atrocity. And so I was labeled a denialist after I wrote this, after I wrote an article about freedom of speech. Um, student activists secretly record and selectively quote dissenting scholars. And so for at least three years on the social science board in my university, the student council quoted from Professor E that Korean historians are a bunch of nationalist liars. But they, but this was a selective quote because this was from my 2019 class lecture two years ago before, you know, uh, and then the discussion was on paradigm shifts and Professor E was actually quoting Dr. Eon Hoon. The full quote is that Eon Hoon, he says that Korean historians are a bunch of nationalist liars, uh, but it was selectively edited to, to make it seem like that I said that. Uh, and so this is the Korean version signed by many Korean by many Korean student groups from my university. Okay, and uh, who's responsible and so forth. Um, it, but it, it, that's not something that that we can sort of um, chat about with uh, much uh, productivity. It's something that really requires going. Um, trying to figure out what sort of evidence um, we could possibly come up with that would uh, lead us to try to figure this out a little better. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, can we hear from maybe two? Can we hear from other people before we, before I respond? Okay, so I see, you know, I see a lot of new faces, like, uh, for example, Cheng Yin Ling. Uh, do you want to say hi and share your thoughts? Or Hiroki or Yamamoto, Megan Curry. Yeah, Cheng Yin Lee or Hiroki or Yamamoto or A. <laughs> we love to hear your thoughts, especially if you disagree with any of the viewpoints here. Okay. Uh, let me see now. Uh, or how about, you know, maybe how about other people like, um, you know, Sh Sean or Professor Tu, you want to say something? Yes, um, uh, just a moment. Um, yeah, I was, I, was, I was actually going to jump before I was pushed. Um, and, um, I did want to uh, come back to the issue of, of, of sort of comprehensively designating our group as right wing or aligned with the far right. Um, I have a particular view on that. Um, in my case, I was personally, <clears throat> I was accused by a rather cranky historian of Japan of being a, a useful idiot for the Japanese right. Um, and I just wanted to say, well, <clears throat> if I am such a useful idiot, uh, I haven't left much of a pay paper trail for it, one. And two, I haven't been um, thanked by anyone on the Japanese right for so doing. And the only uh, mainstream Japanese publication or media publication uh, that has actually mentioned me by name and in a positive sense is the... the um, the newspaper of the Japanese Communist Party, the Red Flag, um, which they acknowledged a paper I'd written on their foreign policy and more or less thanked me for it. Uh, so I think I want to I want to make a point about the sort of personal political diversity of members of our group, including myself, some of whom lean on the left and some of whom lean on their rights and their uh, their personal politics, but who adopt a procedural liberal viewpoint. 
uh, on issues such as viewpoint diversity and on issues such as academic freedom, which is to say uh, that um, we may advocate and support freedom of speech or the right to uh, to assert, uh, academic freedom by people whom we vehemently disagree with, but that doesn't mean we align with any particular political position which they advocate, uh, either publicly or privately. Anyway, that's all I had to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, we had a comment from uh, Cheng Li. Um, okay, we'd like to respond after learning more about this topic. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cheng Li. Okay. So, yeah, you, you don't have, and so I encourage all of you to uh, share your thoughts. You don't have to be an expert. Um, let me encourage more people, like maybe Megan, Hiroki, or Ivana, do you want to say hi? Yes, hi, everyone. I'm sorry, I came late, so I'm not sure what question we're discussing exactly. Um, but so far, it's very interesting. Nice to meet everyone here. Okay, sure. Uh, Thank, thank you for saying hi. Ivana is going to be one of the discussions for the June 14th. Before we go to the specific questions uh, that I mentioned in my lecture, I'd like to mention that like, I don't think procedural liberalism and victims' rights are necessarily antithetical. That I think, I think procedural liberals will argue that you can better advocate for victims' rights through you know, open rational debates, through good social science. That right now the problem with the comfort woman is just so polarized that we have different facts, right? That we cannot come to agreement. And so I think it's incumbent upon scholars to, to help people come to consensus, to shared facts. And so that way we can discuss whether the 2015 agreement. So personally, as a citizen, I supported every compensation for the comfort woman, including the 1994 Asian Women's Fund, the 2015 agreement as well. If the if you come to a consensus in the facts and the governments decide we should offer more compensation, more apologies, then I think that's fine. And I think, uh, I think, and I actually think that we should have encouraged the women to accept the compensation apologies before they passed away. Okay. But I think all polarization does is like just keep on like dividing the people until these women, they just pass away. And so they don't receive any, so they don't receive any closure. And so I think proceduralism is actually a better way to advocate for women's rights. As a, and I'm speaking as a citizen. Okay, uh, so if there's no other questions, then I was thinking maybe we can tackle the questions one by one from the lecture, okay? And so, uh, okay, so I'm in, okay, so Hiroki, Hiroki also says hello, okay? Uh, and so I, I listed the different questions. If you go to the, if you go to the, you know, the, the public comments. And so, so question one was, you know, you know, like the total number of comfort women, uh, like, was it like 200? Was it like, you know, so the numbers go anywhere from 20,000 to 200,000, right? Or 400,000. Okay. And so uh, can anyone tackle that? What, so what do you, so from your reading or from your own research, what do you think is a reasonable number for the total number, Koreans and non-Koreans? So actually, yeah, actually, you know, the anti-Japan tribalism book by yeah. Professor uh, Lee Yong hoon he says that there were about 2,000 Korean women who worked as comfort women for the Japanese military, only 2,000 Koreans. So the overall... Uh, the grand total of comfort women during that period, I thought he said was something like maybe up to 10,000, but that's the grand total. See? So it's it's much lower than, you know, of course, 200,000 or even 20,000 that some people even mentioned. Okay, so Chizuko's uh, reading of anti-Japan trialism, probably 2,000 up to 10,000. Uh, yes, Mark, go ahead. Uh, Mark, turn yeah. you. Um, no, th that's right, and and thank you. Uh, and um, I, I second what uh, Chizuko is saying. Um, the, the way in which this is usually calculated um, is, um, is working backwards from the number of uh, Japanese uh, soldiers uh, who are out uh, on uh, um, out out on duty uh, at any one time, 
uh, and then figure that uh, in general, the soldiers um, tried uh, to go to a brothel once a month, uh, once, um, was it once a week, once a month. Uh, and uh, and uh, you can work work it there by looking at how much they're paid and how much the brothels charge, um, and uh, and then figure uh, the uh, prostitutes for the most part seem to have seen somewhere between four and five uh, men a night, uh, and so you you know work take them take those numbers and you can work out and figure out how many uh, <clears throat> comfort women were likely. Uh, in uh, working at any one given time, uh, and then, uh, you, then, and then the complications come in uh, in terms of how much of uh, labor turnover there was. Uh, it seems like, in general, that the the comfort women worked about a, a year and a half. They 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 were typically on two year contracts, um, and. Um, uh, so then, um, if you uh, have um, in, in, over the course of uh, five years, uh, you have uh, people working one and a half, two years, uh, then uh, you figure out how many people uh, would be working at any one time and then multiply it by two. Um, what complicates these things uh, is that uh, in some areas, uh, particularly in places like Indonesia, uh, where the uh, army is moving very fast, um, and going forward, going backwards, retreating, and so forth. Um, the, uh, the 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 comfort women are not going to be serving very long at all. Uh, it's possible that uh, at any given time, Japanese uh, soldiers will not be at a comfort station. There simply isn't one. They didn't have time to get anything established. Um, but if they're moving fairly fast uh, and they're only in some place, one place for, uh, say, six weeks and then boom, they're off in another place, uh, then you're going to have a turnover ratio for comfort women uh, that's uh, quite high. Uh, so you'll end up with more comfort women, but uh, any particular woman uh, will, will have worked for a lot shorter period, right? In other words, when the, if the army's on, on the move, um, as they were particularly during towards the last year or two of the war, um, then they're not going to be patronizing um, any one uh, comfort station very long at all. Uh, that's going to mean that uh, the comfort women aren't going to work very long. Uh, in turn, it will mean that there are more comfort women cycling through these jobs. Um, so all of those things, um, just to... Um, uh, make a point that probably, you know, maybe, uh, Joseph, you don't want made, but that it, it turns out to be very complicated. Um, the, the more, uh, the shorter the period that these women worked, uh, the more comfort women uh, there would be in total. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, building on that, uh, could you comment on the, could you comment on this, uh, because I think in your book you don't you didn't find any evidence that any woman was intentionally abducted, right? But could you tell us about the level of deception, the corruption? So the level of deception and corruption, and what was the and how and was the and was the Japanese military aware of these uh, you know corruptions and corruptions and deceptions? Um, uh, you know, I mean, and again, um, you're you're looking at historical materials and you're trying to make sense of it and you're trying to tell a story that that fits with the materials that you have. Um, it, it doesn't seem as uh, certainly there's uh, to my evidence um, other than um, a relatively small number of um, uh, comfort women, uh, particularly those favored by the Korean Council. Uh, there's virtually no evidence uh, that uh, the Japanese uh, military uh, forced women into this. Uh, but it's it's worth, I think, sort of stepping back uh, and uh, and thinking, you know, have has anyone ever been to a military base that of any country that was not surrounded by brothels? And I think the answer is no. Of course, this is a, a terrible job, uh, but uh, there are. In most any society, there is a, a group of uh, young women from very poor circumstances who decide this is the the least bad job available to them. So you're not short of of uh, women who want to do this work. And so the notion that 
uh, the Japanese government would be forcing people to do this just intuitively makes no sense. Um, and then ask yourself, as you're, you're running a brothel, uh, do you really want to have women who don't want to be there? Uh, I mean, it, it dramatically raises uh, your enforcement costs of uh, trying to keep them from running away. Um, you also, um, as a brothel, make money only primarily if you have mostly women who are trying to please their customers. That's how you get people to come back and and. Uh, and so the notion that you would try to fool people into doing this on a wide scale itself also just somehow um, it, when you're talking about this, your alar alarms ought to go off in your head uh, that this stuff is possible, uh, but that sort of basic logic uh, should raise uh, questions. Now, we, uh, um, uh, in the um, largest number of uh, comfort women uh, seem to have come from Japan. Uh, there is in all the discussion of um, the industry uh, in Japan, I've not seen uh, any discussion of uh, Japanese women uh, that I can recall at this point uh, being fooled into this uh, by recruiters. Uh, but at the same time, um, there, there's a lot of um, dis there's a lot of uh, there, are, there are relatively high numbers. Uh, in police reports uh, in Korea, and, and also accounts in Korean newspapers of uh, fraudulent labor recruiters who go out to the uh, to the boonies and, rec and, and um, uh, recruit uh, uh, boys and girls uh, into um, jobs by promising uh, uh, false jobs. And, to, and when it comes to the, the um, young women, to the girls, uh, it's often to the uh, brothels in the big cities. Um, so there's there's enough of this discussion going on to make you one think that um, uh, that in fact uh, it was a real problem, um, and if it's happening to the brothels uh, in uh, the large cities on the peninsula, then why wouldn't it also be happening uh, to uh, for recruiting uh, to the comfort stations? Um, so there there is that. I mean, there's that that uh, makes um, one think that makes me think that um, it was some sort of a problem. How big of a problem? Uh, well, um, as I understand it, uh, the the police in Japan uh, and Korea, which was part of Japan, uh, would not give exit permits uh, to um, women who were going to work at the comfort stations uh, to leave the country unless they showed up at the police station with their contract uh, and um, had the police officer explain to her what it was she was doing. Uh, the Japanese government understood that there were these fraudulent recruiters, and it didn't want um, uh, the uh, them to be uh, moving women in, uh, to a uh, comfort station overseas on false pretenses. It just didn't work. Um, you know, they're not happy. Uh, everything becomes more troublesome. It's much easier to run an army. Uh, if there are brothels next to the army base that aren't simultaneously causing problems caused by women who are claiming to have been fooled to get there and so forth. Uh, and so and uh, <clears throat> so you had to get an exit interview um, and you had to have it explained to you when you showed up, um, uh, especially in the uh, large cities where there was a stable population of um, uh, brothels, uh, and I'm thinking of Wuhan, which is uh, where I read um, the, an account by some by a, an officer who's in charge of overseeing uh, the the comfort stations. Is when you first showed up, uh, the new uh, prostitutes uh, would have to be interviewed by the uh, the Japanese supervisor, whose charge it was to make sure that in part that the brothels weren't cheating the women. Um, and if they got somebody who said, um, you know, no, I wasn't uh, promised uh, this job. I was told that I would be uh, doing the laundry. Uh, then um, they claim uh, that they did not let the brothel force the woman into sex work. Uh, if she was fooled, uh, this was another uh, barrier that the brothel was going to have to overcome. All of which is not to say that it didn't happen. Uh, but it's that you had these barriers uh, that are going to make it harder to get this done, which in turn ought to f have a feedback effect, uh, causing uh, fewer uh, uh, recruiters to engage in this sort of a fraud uh, going forward. Uh, you know, and um, people say, 
um, and um, Joseph, uh, you said this, uh, and it's worth stressing, people say what they want to have heard. Um, and, um, you know, that's that's true for uh, defectors. It's true, I think, for the elderly women who worked in the brothels. Uh, but it's also true for the army officers. And I will tell you um, that um, one of the uh, memoirs of an army officer uh, that I read uh, talked about how they're in the officer's club uh, having their drinks in the evening, uh, and the doctor comes in, uh, and the doctor says, uh, you know, I got a problem. Uh, I have um, been um, inspecting, doing the uh, the health checks for the new recruits uh, to the comfort stations, um, and there's this woman who's a virgin. What are we supposed to do? Uh, and this was um, uh, this is all discussed in the memoir as this is a, sh a shocking thing. Uh, they didn't know what to do. So um, the report that the uh, the writer of the memoir um, gives is the officers took up a collection uh, and uh, they bought the young woman out uh, and sent her home. So, um, you know, um, there, there are these stories which are convenient to the tellers, and they go both sides. Uh, and uh, I, one should be uh, skeptical, I think, of uh, self-serving uh, statements that go both directions. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, I see a hand from Sean. Go ahead, Sean. Just a moment, okay. Uh, and I've got to withdraw that hand too. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's something I was going to uh, raise in the next um, webinar, but I'll, I'll kind of preface it here. Uh, I agree with Mark that um, that there is a strong validity in approaching this as, as an empirical issue and not just as, an, as a normative issue. So I, for example, might have normative concerns about the very notion of contract and cite Carol Pateman and say that the sort of contract we're talking about here is one that uh, basically enacts a, a relationship of sexual subordination between the the hiring partner or the using party and the the women who are subjected to it in, in in prostitution, but I want to put that aside and raise the empirical question instead. And this concerns, I, I guess, speaking as a non-ideal theorist, about the non-ideal conditions which can afflict these kinds of contracts. Um, if if we are talking about contracts, and we're ex accepting that they exist, particularly where it involves trafficking women from their homes to distant locales or to distant countries as prostitutes, not just in the Japanese system. We could also speak of the French uh, uh, 20th century prostitution system, which trafficked Moroccan and Algerian women, uh, both to metropolitan France in the post-war era and to Vietnam during the first Indochina War. <clears throat> so are there kind of structural conditions which um, basically uh, incentivize non-compliance, and I mean non-compliance by the more powerful parties in these kinds of contracts, assuming there, there was some kind of contracts operating and that there was a legal or quasi-legal uh, setting in which these contracts were recognized. Uh, so this ex covers not just deceptive recruiting and how systematic it became, where the military organizations which were recruiting uh, outsourced it to recruiters and more or less outsourced responsibility for any shortfalls uh, or non-compliance in recruitment. So deception, uh, forcible recruitment where it occurred, um, <clears throat> but also within the terms of the working conditions of the women them themselves, exploitation, uh, being compelled to provide more sex work than they had, they believed they were going to pr provide, uh, subjection to uh, violent abuse and rape uh, where police uh, enforcement or military police enforcement was uh, very patchy or absent, and also forcible re-recruitment by women who had actually resigned uh, for, or had uh, served out their contract and were leaving. Uh, and this sort of thing uh, could, could be said to occur in conditions where there were recruitment shortfalls. Uh, I'm not going to go into the empirical information about this here. I'm just sort of foreshadowing this. But it's interesting to note that there are tales here and there of this kind of thing going on. For example, in the diary of a comfort women's station manager, the Korean language, Japanese language diary, which was discovered, I think, in the past decade and published. Uh, there is an entry about uh, uh, the Japanese medical officers requiring to women who had required, who had two Korean women who had uh, retired and finished, uh, served out their contract uh, to a brothel in, in Myanmar, in Burma, being required to, to uh, appear for a medical examination. And this was a signal that they were to be re recruited into the comfort women's system or comfort women's station in that town. Uh, and there is 
evidence from the text to see that they did not want to, or this is not something that was voluntary for them. So I think these, these are things which you can explore, I and mean, issues of non-compliance, um, even when we presume that there are contracts uh, in operation and we look or we consider empirical evidence for them. So I just want to stress again, this is an empirical rather than a normative question. Uh, and that's that's just all I wanted to say. Okay, sure. And then uh, I see some other people like YS Lee. Uh, YS Lee, uh, Mr. Lee, do you want to speak? Okay. Uh, everybody else, I encourage you to turn on your video so we can at least see each other's faces, make it more intimate. And if you're, you know, if you're secretly recording this discussion, that's fine. Just, uh, just send me a copy. I forgot to record the first half. <laughs> okay. And then uh, I think some of my students have questions. Can you come up? Do you want? Yeah, you can come up. Introduce yourself. Right. And that, you can leave your computer there. Yeah. And then uh, also at the end, you, you guys can let me know if, if, it, if it's okay to post this on YouTube, make this kind of a public forum, or if, if, if it's too sensitive, maybe I'm not going to post it. Okay, so let me know. Okay, introduce yourself. Jiwan, say hello. Hello. Uh, okay, camera, follow me. Where's the camera? I think you have to walk over on that side. Okay, okay, now he's following me. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Jiwan. Right. Um, Introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Jiwan. I'm from South Korea. I'm studying here at uh, the International Studies at Hanyang University. And um, I just want to first thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity. Um, I think I just mainly have a question as just throughout the whole this discussion today. Uh, it seems like the main course was that either the comfort woman who claimed they either went there voluntarily and now they're either lying or that there was a case of like false memory. And so although I do think it's possible that this is the case, I was curious as to like, because South Korea is not the only country that's kind of putting out cases of comfort women. From my knowledge, I know that the Philippines and also Taiwan and Indonesia are also putting out cases of uh, where women are coming forward claiming that they've also been subjugated to um, Japanese comfort women kind of uh, sexual slavery in a way or like they've experienced mm -hmm. rape and so I was curious as to like what everybody thought about um, whether it's possible for women from different cultures to collectively all have the same rhetoric in terms of like the same false memory because they're coming up with similar claims and also I was also curious as to whether um, I also understand that with military bases it's always common for uh, there to be prostitution kind of around it and for women, because it is a viable option, especially for women in poverty. However, I was also curious as to whether it could truly be argued that it's consensual in a way, like the fact that I'm not, I think especially as a South Korean, I don't want to make it seem like I'm trying to push a nationalist like uh, perspective on this and saying that Japan is the only wrong country. I think the perspective that at least more than maybe perhaps a younger generation have is maybe states like there, the fact that there is a demand and supply of sex in general should be wrong. Like it shouldn't be, like we shouldn't be blaming either just the Japanese or the Korean, but I feel like the fact that um, perhaps Korean or uh, fraudulence were um, deceiving women, but also the fact that the Japanese military was willing to incorporate that, I feel like in itself is morally questionable. And also the idea of just consent, I think with Japan, especially during the war, with infamous cases like Unit 731 and all that, I don't know if consent was a very like normalized idea in the time. So I just wanted to hear people's thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, who wants to tackle Chi Wan's question? So Chi Wan was stating that you know you have like uh, women coming out from multiple countries, not just Korea, about cases of like you know abduction, coercion, slavery. And so are they, you know, and so why is that? Okay, who wants to tackle those questions? Okay, maybe I can say something. Uh, okay. So, <clears throat> you know, Professor Park Yu Ha, uh, she has a very good argument about, you know, the, the, the fact that the comfort women were not monolithic at mm -hmm. all, uh, as as Chiwon said, there were many nationalities, uh, women from different nations saying that, okay, I was a comfort woman, okay, or I was raped by 
a Japanese military man, et cetera, et cetera, right? So yeah, looks like there were many, many comfort women from many different nationalities. Yeah, but at the same time, we got to distinguish uh, the women from Japan or Japanese empire uh, versus other nationalities, women from other nations or Japan's enemy nations, see? So, so that the women from the Japanese empire, in other words, Japanese women, Korean women or Taiwan women, they had Japanese citizenship and they were recruited in their home country and they were brought to the war, war zone or, or the battlefield, right? But whereas the other women, Filipino women, Chinese women, or the Dutch women living in uh, Indonesia, they were just recruited on the spot, on the site, or sometimes they were just raped, or they just somehow got involved in you know this uh, this crazy situation, like Dutch women, for example, in Indonesia. So there was this one incident of a clear war crime by this particular Japanese general, a uh, Japanese officer who forced Dutch women to serve as uh, comfort women in a you know makeshift comfort station, right, for three months or so. But that was a war crime. And these, this Japanese unit was severely punished right after. Actually, well, the Japanese, actually the military uh, headquarter came out and then, you know, the, they took down that comfort station immediately, actually. So, okay, so you cannot put all these women all together and say, oh, they were all same. No, no, no. They were totally different, right? So Japanese women, Korean women, they were recruited at home in their home country and brought, you know, by ship to China or Southeast Asia, you know, where the Japanese military were, right? And so that's a very different situation from Chinese or Filipino or Dutch women who were raped at the site, right? Um, and actually, I was so surprised that uh, Indonesian women, when the, the Japan's um, Asian Women's Fund was in operation in the 1990s, so they asked the Japanese uh, organization asked, you know, so so please step forward if you are a comfort woman during the war, and that uh, something like one million Indonesian women stepped forward. You know, something like that. And of course, you know, that was not credible. And so the Japanese government decided to just give a lump sum to the Indonesian government so that they could, you know, uh, establish some uh, some institution to take care of some women, right? Or, you know, to, to do something good for the communities in Indonesia, things like that. So... So that's one thing that we should be careful about. Yeah, so so rapes and you know makeshift comfort stations, these things did happen, unfortunately. That's true. But we cannot say that, that just because these things happen, okay, the same thing happened to the Korean women. No, that's not true at all. Okay. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, Marie, go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> I think Chisco just made a very important question, which we uh, tend to forget. Korea was part of the Japanese empire, fully part of the empire, and the Japanese law was fully enforced in Korea, both civil law and criminal law. In that sense, colonial Korea was not the same as elsewhere, say China or Indonesia for that matter. And uh, it is a little bit unfortunate that so many scholars seem to forget that fact and uh, put this comfort woman issue in this broader terms of uh, war violence. And I think we need to pay attention to the difference. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you come up? 
Okay, I have. Uh, does anyone want to speak, uh, share your thoughts or questions or comments? Uh, I see like Mr. Y.S. Lee, uh, Megan Curry, uh, Yamamoto. Okay, A. Uh, if not, then go ahead, introduce yourself. Oh, it's fine. Okay. Can I read this? Sure. Yeah. First, introduce us. My name is. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Sesung Lee. I'm a student of Hanyang University. My major is data science. But I'm in, interested in politics, and I want to hear this course. And I understand the Mar Mark's position or mm, position to some extent when you say that comfort woman had a terrible job, but choose it due to the economic factor or their family or own will. Then considering that the Japanese military want to sexually exploit Korean women for the war against China, use them, and that many of them die, and that their economic situation was triggered by Japan, do you think that the ex existence um, contracts, contracts in the recruitment process and the fact that forced mobilization occurred in part by PIMP, exploited by military sufficiently, justify Japan's responsibility? Okay, right. So Hesong is saying, you know, what, you know, because of the structural conditions that, you know, like, yes, the women were experienced poverty, but how much is Japan responsible for that? You know, because Japan was a colonial power, Japan started war. So were they not respons ultimately responsible for the structural conditions in the first place? Okay. Um, so who, who who wants to tackle that? Maybe Mark first and then other people? Um, I mean, to be honest, I'm not interested in who's, inter who's responsible for this. Uh, we have a historical question. It's what happened? Uh, and trying and once one starts uh, putting on, well, you know, who's at fault and so forth, uh, it inevitably really clouds uh, the discussion about what actually happened. Uh, and <clears throat> and, we, and we can go, you know, the, the, the way this question was phrased, um, the, the question appears after a whole uh, list of postulates, uh, the majority of which I think are probably false, um, as in... Uh, um, you know, is, um, is, is Korea impoverished because uh, it was a Japanese colony or was it richer because it was a Japanese colony and so forth? Um, you know, it, one can't, uh, each of those uh, is, um, you know, 10 books uh, and we can do there, uh, go there if one wanted to. I'm not interested in going there. I think we need to focus on what happened uh, and uh, to try to force ourselves away from asking who's responsible. Okay, thank you, Mark. Anybody else? Okay, if not, then let's go to the last question that I had. Uh, I think we, I think we all, I think we can agree that you know, like uh, harassment uh, restrictions on civil liberty goes both ways. That we, that scholars face restrictions from both right wing and left wing. Okay, uh, so what are you know, so. Maybe in South Korea, there's left wing restrictions on scholars, and then in Japan, many scholars are harassed by maybe some right wing people. And so, um, I was wondering if we can talk about Joseph. Joseph that's just not true. Uh, okay. Japan, Japan is a very free country in terms of academics, and um, it, it's it's just not the case that uh, left wing academics in Japan are harassed. I know I hear about it uh, in the U.S. and so forth. I, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but but sure. yeah, that's fine. Anyways, Actually, yeah. can I speak to that? Can I speak to that? Um, <clears throat> it's it depends on how you how you define the harassment. If it's just online mobbing, uh, then yes, it happens. Um, I've experienced a little taste of this. Uh, luckily, I wasn't on Twitter at the time, but yes, the, there were people getting worked up at me over a series of articles I wrote on, on Japanese whaling. Um, so yeah, if if we're talking about uh, harassment with an aim to involve the law, because there's criminal defamation laws or there's a national security law that you can evoke to have someone cancelled or have someone actually taken to court, no, Japan is not like that. If you have people making all sorts of threats and trying to get people sacked, even if they don't succeed, um, yes, that does happen in Japan. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering if maybe just in terms of the, what is the nature of public discourse? How is, how has this evolved in the past three years? 
So last week, we were discussing the role of race in college admissions, affirmative action, which is a very sensitive topic in America. And the professor said there has been an evolution of discourse. And so in the past, like it, it was a sensitive topic. The Asian Americans who sued Harvard, they were actually kept anonymous because it was such a sensitive topic. But now the professors feel that, you know, the role of race in college has kind of opened up. And I'm wondering about comfort women debate. It seems like this is one of the most sensitive topics in East Asia and East Asian studies. Do you see an evolution or do you, or not really? Okay. Is the debate becoming more open, less open, or just nothing's, nothing's changing? And so I would like, the, yeah, I'd like to hear from your, you know, different scholars' perspectives from South Korea, Japan, and U.S. and other countries. Okay. So, uh, she's a go. oh yes, go ahead, Ivana. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I go to the University of Arizona and I'm a political science and East Asian studies major. Um, I focus on Korean studies with an emphasis on women's studies, that type of thing. Um, and what I've noticed from my East Asian studies classes is that the comfort woman issue is taught in one way and that is considered the, um, the correct form of history. And that does tend to be on the leftist view of um, them being sex slaves and that type of thing. And that's what I've been taught here in the US. Um, and I don't see in the classrooms, the issue being like, I don't feel free about being able to talk about it and ask questions and just even question the majority view. I don't really feel comfortable doing that in my East Asian studies classes. Um, I feel like mostly it comes with, it doesn't feel as though I can say it to the professor without being put down. And I've also, because I've studied in South Korea for one year, I also felt the same way when it comes to certain issues that I can't really say certain things or ask certain, certain questions. So I feel like with the comfort woman issue in the U.S. at least, I don't really feel like it's been opened up at all. Yeah. Okay, uh, we can build on what Ivana said. So, for example, like, you know, Chizuko and Marie. Uh, so, let's say, like, Ivana is, like, speaking up, right? Say, like, you know, let's question the dominant narrative. You know, we should read books like, you know, Sarah So, Pak Yuha, and Mark Ramsier, you know, maybe add to the discussion. Uh, do you think, if Ivana gets a reputation for that, do you think, you know, Chizuko, you know, where she be accepted? Would that help her hurt her or not matter when she applies to University of Hawaii for grad school? Okay, so. Of it, course, I would welcome somebody like Ivana <clears throat> who would challenge the conventional views or at least examine, you know, the ongoing views. <clears throat> but I'm not so sure about, <clears throat> excuse me, other faculty members, I'm not so sure. I see. So to be on the safe side, maybe, maybe Ivana should not talk about it until she gets into grad school or until, maybe until she gets a tenure job. <laughs> right. And so I'm just, so I'm just thinking like, you know, you know, for young people like you, right, you know, how, you know, how much freedom do you have to talk about this? Okay. Uh, Marie, do you have any thoughts? About that too. Oh, yeah, yes, sorry. go ahead, Ivana. Mm -hmm. I've actually worried about that too, especially recently, um, because I am in the process of applying to grad schools, and I've worried about what I can say and what I can't say and what I can't ask and all of that type of thing, and I feel like I shouldn't have to because it's an academic space, but that's just the position I'm in right now. I see. Ivana, what major? Is it like Asian studies or political science or sociology? Uh, For grad school? Yeah. Um, I'm looking in continuing with East Asian studies, um, international global affairs, that type of thing. Sure. So I think the, maybe like the open discourse, it may depend on the department and also depend on the university, right? So, okay. Uh, Marie or, oh, Sean, do you, did you have a hand? You have something to ask or say? <laughs> Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, Um. I guess, you look at some of the grad schools uh, and you look at some of the professors who are in them. And if, if there are professors who are very, very vocal and very online uh, about political issues, and it seems like they're giving out an atmosphere of intolerance 
uh, for certain kinds of perspectives which are outside of the acceptable mainstream on those kinds of topics, um, then it might be something to avoid. Uh, so yes, yeah, so checking out Twitter, checking out social media, uh, and also sort of looking at the profile of the faculties you're applying to. If there are some individuals like that, then I would advise not applying. And I'm speaking as a bit of a lefty myself when I say that. So of course, I want people to have freedom of inquiry. I want them to be able to explore topics which are uncomfortable to you know, an established orthodoxy. But yes, we have to be on the lookout for people who are quite dogmatic uh, and intolerant, um, it, even if they are very prestigious members of, the prof of their profession who tend to be dogmatic uh, in, in things such as uh, graduate student recruit recruitment uh, and also in the treatment of their graduate students. Um, not naming any names. This is just my inference. Um, okay, that's fine. Uh, and Mark, I you know, so I think most of us read your book. Uh, so you went through a tough like three years. At the same time, you're still there. Uh, and so has the discourse has the discourse changed at Harvard, or do you see any evolution at all? Uh. <clears throat> Well, um, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I, 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 it's easy to, uh, if you're at Harvard, to think that the world um, revolves around Harvard. Uh, but in this case, I think uh, the world is paying attention to Harvard in the course of the last year. And there have been so many disasters at Harvard uh, that, um, it, you know, it's actually people have forgotten about the comfort women at Harvard. Um, there's just there's just so much else that's um, that's going on. Yeah, um, uh, Yvonne, um, good luck applying to graduate schools. I I I I would love to help you, but I haven't a clue what to say. Um, you know. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark raised an interesting point about all these other issues happening. One thing that I noticed is a lot of the core activists they tie all these issues together. And so it's like comfort women, North Korea, Palestinians, it's, they're, they're all connected in terms of global solidarity. Um, and so, yeah, I wonder if you saw that in your campus, because this is something that I'm seeing in my North Korea research that I wanted to, you know, so I, I participate with Korea Peace Now in their, you know, faith-based caucus. And I like to focus on, you know, lifting sanctions against North Korea. But, you know, many of my fellow activists, they're, you know, they also, instead of focus, instead of just focusing on North Korea, they also want to talk about comfort women and the Palestinians. And so there's a divergence of views that, you know, whether we should focus on one issue or tie everything together. Okay, so that's just one observation. Uh, okay, so, all right. Is, is there uh, anybody else who wanted to say anything? Okay. Just, just on a procedural note, I think, uh, I think three years ago, like you know, I heard a case about uh, about some somebody who was getting harassed in Japan, and I did ask Mark to you know speak out a little bit. So I think Mark said something to maybe some conservative newspapers in Japan. So I was glad that I was glad that Mark responded that way. So I think most of us can agree that yeah, we want you know we want a free you know we want you know tolerant and open debate for all people. Okay, is there any other questions or comments at this time? Okay, if not, then I'd like to thank everybody for participating and I hope to see you all again in a two weeks with a bit more, uh, with a bit more, which might have a bit more fireworks. Okay, thanks again, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>